it's our first brief for the week, and our brief for this afternoon is in three parts. Um, for the first part, I'm sure you'll recall that last week, uh, Friday, we held a national consultative meeting uh, on stakeholders, or with stakeholders uh, on broadcasting in Ghana to deal with some of the emerging uh, issues. Uh, the meeting agreed on a line of action to deal with unethical content on our broadcast platforms immediately. And I'll be sharing with you the communique and then we'll give you the, uh, the soft copy so that you can also share with your audiences. The second brief is also from the Ghana Investment Promotion Center that is working to ensure that the full benefits of some $2.6 billion worth of FDI that Ghana succeeded in attracting last year, even in the midst of, a, uh, of the pandemic, um, is put to full use and the projected number of jobs associated with it also occasion for the benefit of Ghanaians across this country. So I'll share that detail with you as well. I think it comes with a PowerPoint presentation. I'll share that detail with you. Our third brief is on COVID. As I'm sure you are aware, many persons are getting close to their second shot by now. So what are the details on this second um, COVID shield shot? The um, enhanced, or is it expanded? Expanded, expanded vaccination program had uh, the head of the Ghana Health Service, Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service, they are all with us uh, and they'll share with us the details. I think we need to tweak our microphones a bit because you can hear the echo. So um, good afternoon and uh, welcome once again. On Friday, 16th of April, 2021, the Ministry of Information hosted a stakeholders consultative meeting on emerging issues relevant to broadcasting in Ghana. The meeting took place at the Alisa Hotel, Ridge, Accra. Stakeholders engaged included the Ministry of Information, the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General's Department, the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development, the National Media Commission, the National Communications Authority, the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, the Ghana Journalist Association, civil society groups including the Media Foundation for West Africa, the Judiciary, the Bank of Ghana, the National Cyber Security Center, the National Security Secretariat, the Communications Select Committee of Parliament, the UNESCO Ghana Commission Office, the National Film Authority, the Local Government Service, and the Gaming Commission. So this was a very broad-based consultation that took place. The discussions focused specifically on two things. One, regulatory collaboration to address an ethical broadcast content. And two, the draft broadcasting bill. Now let me deal with the first matter. To address the question of unethical broadcast content, stakeholders agreed to set up a joint stakeholder group under the National Media Commission to examine reports of unethical content and invoke the powers of the National Communication Authority to take punitive action against offending broadcasters. And here are the specifics. One, stakeholders have agreed that within 14 days of this meeting, they will sign up to a memorandum of cooperation among themselves to formalize the roadmap for action. Two, key to the arrangements in this memorandum of cooperation is a setting up of a joint stakeholder group which will operate as a committee of the National Media Commission in accordance with Section 10 of the NMC Act 1993, Act 449. Three, the members or the membership of this committee are to include representatives of the National Media Commission, the National Communication Authority, the National Security Secretariat, the Bank of Ghana, the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, the Ghana Journalist Association, and the Office of the Attorney General. The work of the committee is to, among other things, do the following. One, monitor the broadcasting landscape to identify and examine complaints of unethical broadcast content. These include content that are offensive to national security interest, 
public order, public morality, and also against the reputations, rights, and freedoms of other persons. You'll find them listed, I think, under Article 164 of our Constitution. Two, they will provide an early warning system for flagging such unethical broadcast content. And three, they will make recommendations, or this committee will make recommendations to the relevant regulators. And these recommendations include one, recommendations for the issuance and publications of warnings where that is appropriate, recommendations for the suspension of frequency authorization by the National Communication Authority. So for media houses that are publishing this kind of content, once this committee starts work, if they find that your content is in breach and your attention is drawn and the necessary remedies are not occasioned as uh, requested, they will make recommendations for the suspension of frequency authorization by the National Communications Authority. They also make recommendations for the withdrawal of frequency authorization, where need be, by the National Communications Authority. Um, so on the matter of unethical content on our broad, uh, broadcast landscape, this is what the Consultative Forum has agreed uh, to do. And within 14 days, they will execute that memorandum of cooperation and start work accordingly. They will examine um, themselves, and then they will also receive uh, complaints and examine those um, complaints as they receive. And whichever of the recommendations are appropriate, they will make those recommendations. Now, in the matter of the draft broadcasting bill, the meeting also examined key issues that are being considered in the development of a broadcasting law for Ghana. Now, while agreeing on several policy propositions, other policy propositions required further address through written memoranda from the stakeholder groups. So the stakeholders agreed to submit formal written memos on the bill for the immediate attention of the ministry uh, in formulating a final draft. Stakeholders also further agreed to engage the judiciary on the balance between media gatekeeping and protecting the freedoms of media and expression. The ministry also undertook to secure the needed approvals and lay the bill before parliament immediately upon the conclusion of these consultations. Stakeholders were pleased with the open and frank engagement uh, and committed to work together to achieve results with urgency. And the Minister of Information has also committed to hold uh, this engagement annually to examine development in the industry and agree with stakeholders on measures to further develop the industry. So uh, those are the details of the communique um, as agreed to by the stakeholders. And we will give you um, copies so that for your publication tonight and tomorrow, uh, on your various media outlets, you are able to make them available to the Ghanaian public. Let me quickly do a summary of that in chief so that I don't have to come back uh, to it. If you are a person who is a person who is a person who is a person who is a Na na ye hwe eniema e koso e wo ye radio ye TV abe fontin time so ayi ni na ye ni ni hu ayi kan hu asem na kwa ebe ni ni na ya dwembe ko benko mi etumi akon etia eh ye di nkomo wie ye no dey a eku ahodu yi eji tu mu ni se na otwi mienu ntam no mu de o mu sabe she krata ase a e be kire kwan o mbe fa so aye adwuma bom akon etia niema e koso ye TV ni ye radio ni abe fontin time so aye nsem fata e toso mienu de o mu be ye wo sa a coin of Mofaso Ed Mabum Nese National Media Commission. I need be a cotton war media, a Jumano, the Perperi Yemuno, or Momrano section ten. A mom coin more mote committee, a BNMC for BF for four at the year Juma. To a mobile tech committee under section ten of NMC Act, no, as our committee, no, NMC for was subi, National Communication Authority for was subi, National Security for was subi, Bank of Ghana for was subi, Giba. Any now a broadcasting, you may say, Giba, say, Giba, a hobby, Central for Ghana Journalist Association, a hobby, and San Office of the Attorney General, a hobby. You may do me the kind of say, or more do many baby D, their friend of broadcasting landscape, radio, TV, Abbey from Tin Times, so only any BDH. Say, or monk as almost shall not say, be a BBA, M for quiet, fast year, you may so, their friend on ethical broadcast content. And I said, so be the report to Brown said, they'll be here on the TV and on the radio and on the for 10 times or no, on ethical broadcast content. On the other hand, I said, so, I'm part of the ETA, the first year, Jumaya now. So, I'm going to be a new man, ETA national security, and our public order, public morality, 
anadia um ekuti ankofu din ne sebe omobobre against the rights and freedoms and reputations of other persons etosu mi no omo no be di kan kra yi asu tri se de ekosu wa he etia kwan e faso ye djuma de ekosu wa he etia kwan e faso ye djuma e flagging and ethical broadcast content and as an early warning system for flagging and ethical broadcast content etosu mi en sa committee no omo na fi omo recommendations titi wa dia national communication authority ti say am license na dia wo de ye no etia enema ho do ya ye kan ya se se sa committee ne betwe national communication authority adwenya si su sem pacho station we see e wo say suspend your frequency authorization and a station we see e wo say omo de ndia ya withdraw on frequency authorization no eh kra and as a baby, I was a moment warning near Bong de Rose Station where Bonoco was a dear way out of your unyai, sir. Your man, or maybe a now watching you know, and I say, Bosomi, so unyai, you be two and a mong, maybe I suspend you now. Yes, and see is on suspend you now, and see, sir, on withdraw cry. Now, sir, they will bonus or more amain and ask what in tea. I'm saying, Ubi Adrian Coben, come quite a befasso. Now, I hear you, man, and quite say, Ubi say, Ubi in a yajin. Penifoni na atna se normal hena ya sanitize landscape no. About the broadcasting in Mrana, eno na ye be ye dia ko eni mna. In some do doa e wo broadcasting Mrani mno. Kuwa ho doa e shia e no edge to mu. Ni mani subi wo mu a ya adrian ko benkum inti asro mi se omun pi omachi. No mun steady, no mun ma written memos. O mun kruche o ma adrian ngun krata so Emma yensanka. Na yenti chini ni na na parliament ba idi ya kuto parliament ni 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 na yetu mi ashe humra idi aye juma. So that's a quick update on the consultative forum and the outcomes. As I mentioned, we will make available to you copies of the communique as well. Now, if you can load the GIPC presentation, I'll go to our second brief. If you can go to page two of the GIPC presentation. Now, every year, every country is working to. Uh, deepen investment in the private sector in its economy. And usually, when you measure what comes from abroad, they call it foreign direct investment, as you are aware. Uh, last year, from January to December 2020, despite the pandemic, 279 FDI projects with a total estimated investment value of about $2.7 billion were recorded for the Republic of Ghana. The FDI component, the one coming from abroad was about 2.65 billion, and then about 145 million from the local market. Now, the FDI value of 2.6 is about almost 140% increase over the figure recorded in the year 2019. And we believe it is because of the gradual improvements we continue to make in the economic space here in Ghana, uh, despite the challenges that we have around us, and even in particular, the challenges of the year 2020. If you look at the GIPC presentation that we flagged on the screen, and if we can just open it up a little bit, about 184 of those investments were in the area of services, 57 of them in manufacturing 15 export trade, general trading was about 10, and the rest follow from there. In terms of money value, that'll be the third table. So please go to table 2B, the, um, the next one. In terms of money value, manufacturing uh, had the largest amount, that's about 1.2 billion, and the services, even though it's the largest component, has about 650 million, mining about 420 million, petroleum 222 million, and the rest follow from there. If you look at the regional distribution, about 231 of those projects will be located in Accra or have been located in the greater Accra region, one in the central region, 31 in the western region, three um, in the eastern region, seven in the Ashanti region, three more in the Volta region, um, and one in the Upper East uh, region. We'll share with you the details again so that you can make it available to um, your audiences. Now, the key thing that the GIPC is at this stage leading government to do is to ensure that all of these investments, um, in terms of their equity comp uh, uh, compositions and then their logistics compositions, are onboarded fully 
so that the jobs and opportunities associated with them can be fully realized by the Ghanaian people. So for example, it's estimated that a total of 27,000 jobs expected to be generated from the 279 projects with operations at full capacity. Uh, about 22,000 of those jobs are expected to be for Ghanaians, while about 1,064 of those jobs, that's just about 5%, expected to be taken up by expatriates or uh, non ghanaians And these investments were mostly coming from China, about 751 million, the UK, about 240 million, South Africa, about another 240 million, Australia, another 240 million, Netherlands, 238 million uh, US dollars thereabout. So what the GIPC is doing at this stage is to ensure that all of these investments are fully realized on the ground so that the jobs and opportunities associated uh, with them are occasioned. And we think it's important that um, we update the Ghanaian public on um, all of this. Now, the GIPC publishes a quarterly database. And so in the next two weeks, they will be publishing or they will join us here to update us on quarter one. And from what they tell us, the quarter one figures already look very good uh, for Ghana. They'll join us to let us know the number of investments, local and international, that we are onboarding in quarter one, which areas, which sectors uh, they are going into, so that we can all track and then uh, answer some of these questions for ourselves without it becoming a public debate about whether it is true or it is not true. So that's a quick update on um, investment and FDI for 2020, and also to signal you that in the next two weeks, that of 2021 20, quarter one, we invite all of you uh, so that the GIPC can uh, brief us. And they inform us that already the quarter one numbers are looking very, very, very promising uh, for Ghana. Um, very quickly, let me take that uh, in chi, and then I invite our uh, friends with the vaccines to vaccinate us <laughs> almost immediately. Afiebia, omai bia efe kwa ya ibe to me ama angkrangkwe nyuma kone nim. I'm say kwa ya efaso fe ya investments are hena eba investments ni bi if you are man oni bi if you are mine nimu the if you are man oni no the friend of foreign direct investment. And so now, if you mind one case, I'll be any any sicker or many man. I open this guy crowd. He be a friend domestic investment. Um, 2020 numbers, no, you are can see near we investment projects. I can see a qualify under GIPC. Do you know? Aye, I have no any do soon. I'm going on 279. Oka huske ni na a 2.79 billion dollars, almost 2.8 billion dollars. So that $2.8 billion, no, it moved 2.6, 2.65, until around the alphabet, 2.7, there about, you no. Know, if you are man on any buy, any move here, um, $145 million, and if you're gonna here. Now, here 2.6, now, naturally, they are 2019, you to me, actually, by Ghana, has say, ya bohu, or ha, in chichemu, or ha. Any funny uh, said we are nigh about 140 percent, actually 139, but you can run it off to about 140 percent. Empua safi any mono na yen 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 imsa COVID 19 yare se ni ama yehu atri. Enti ya boga na phone yena basu titiru ya boga ni yonima oji PC ya e boga na hude ura e chini yuma bani ya boga mabaso. Uche yuma ni baby ekwa services any di kind manufacturing export and then a general trading. Ni mumu mumu si kamu edupa ande manufacturing phone di kind and servicing. Uh, services mining na petroleum edia ba enu ma no dodo wona be won kran ha sey western region so benya be ashanti upper east ebenya bi eh se se ejuma gipc ye ne so mo hwe se sa sika ye dia ba o man nim se edi bie bi enu ma eni mfidi a om dia ba eni equity and logistics na aba no om be hwe se ni nyina no om de be ye ejuma ana se sa sa eh for na e bi ejuma no om de sa ne ma nyina be ye ejuma na enu ma ye hwe wo or my name on your name, it's me picture. If you also know, quite on the first one, it's me a trim. Then you money now, not and crying. You come as maybe a tack ready. No be a sub you be a few crack. No bank ready. You come as a But you be to me a pin pin be a call or my name on your name. No more share now. One more at two one among. Now GIPC, a bomb more than say. Bosom me and Sabiano. On the cruce a gun crack. So my investments, baby, I'll be do. No, I'm there to your name. Sabria and Mokasi. Uh, Bosomian said, Dick, I didn't know. Omu, you were Juma, Anissa. 
Intibe na wachi mi nuntem nomba beka yensa ni ni na yatna soma bodi rachre. Inyuma hudo a yetu mi edi abeka huu ewo Ghana hasi busumi mi yensa edi kani ewo Ghana memo hasi. Na kwa yebe faso amasa inyuma no eni huu fidi ako omani mu ni na na dudoso enya huu faso ni arena yaye. That will be it for the second brief. And I'll move to the final brief now. Um, I'm going to ask the team from the Ghana Health Service to be on standby. They will join us very shortly and give us an update on where we are with the vaccination program. Many persons um, were expecting to get their second shot within eight weeks. What is the latest update on that one? And where are we in our general COVID response program? But I ask them to give me just a minute or two as uh, our teams play something up on the screen, and then Dr. Abuaje can take the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm ready when you are. So give a signal when you're ready to project. So this afternoon we'll be giving an update on our COVID situation so far. What has happened at the airport? What has happened in our schools briefly? And then focus uh, end with the vaccination update and the way forward. As an overview, currently we have done more than one million tests as a country since uh, we started testing January 2020. We have experienced two waves, and as you are aware, the second wave was bigger than the first wave. We've had significant decline in our cases since mid-February, and currently we have um, our active cases have dropped from 8,000 to less than 1,500, I'm sure if it's about 1,314 or so. We have so far received 966,850 vaccines, and we have vaccinated more than 800,000 people since we started vaccination on the 2nd of um, March this year. So as further summary, we have um, detected 91,079 cases. As I said, we've done over a million tests with a cumulative positivity of 8.8%. We have discharged 89,000 plus. We have had 70, 771 deaths. And as you are aware, in the last three months, we've had more deaths than we had in nine months of the previous year. The new cases, as of 5th, 15th of April, it's 46. That's about well, three days ago, we recorded 46 new cases across the country. Greater Accra still remains the epicenter because more than half of these 46 were detected in Accra. And currently, all 16 districts have ever reported a case, and 253 districts still have reported a case, which means that we still have about seven or so districts that have never experienced a COVID case across the country. 
The next graph is just the usual graph you see about the epicenters, both in terms of active cases and total cases. And how nothing has changed. Greater Accra remains the epicenter. The five key regions are Greater Accra, Shanti, Eastern, Western and Central region are the core regions where we have cases. In the last second phase, we have a few cases, more, uh, more than usual cases in Northern and Upper East regions. So the next slide shows you the, the waves, and you can see that the second wave is broader and more intense. And we are working towards avoiding a second one, a third one. If you look at the moving average, which is very important in terms of gauging our number of cases, you can see that it follows the, epi the, the spikes that we had in the waves. And currently, we have actually come to a very, very relatively low level and are maintaining that level, and we have to do more to stay there. If you look at the corresponding test that has been done, as you can see, the more you get cases, the more tests you do. So currently, we have had some reduced number of tests, this is excluding the one at the airport. And you can next see that the active cases has significantly dropped. See how we peaked about mid-February, about 8,000 uh, active cases currently is quite relatively low. The next slide shows the same age and sex ratio where um, you have the significant number being uh, over 45 and above, and then we having more males affected compared to females. And so that has not changed much. Of course, it's a comorbidity as a major challenge as we've discussed all along. Hypertension, diabetes, and, uh, and um, and people with diabetes and the combination of both still remains a key challenge as far as uh, your survival and the way you manage the, you survive the case or handle the case is concerned. Okay, so now when you get to the Kotoko International Airport, which is a very major area of preventing importation of uh, cases, we have so far tested about 1,400, uh, we have recorded 1,435 cases since we started on the 1st of September last year. Majority of them are non-Ghanaian citizens. Males outnumber 63 percent of that. We've done 233,000 tests on arrival since we started with a cumulative positivity of 0.61 percent, and so it's not as high as the local community wants. But as you can see in the next slide, since um, January last year, our numbers that is being required at the airport has significantly uh, reduced, averaging around 90s uh, for uh, every year, every month. Uh, around the Easter, we had a few uh, issues. But that is not to say that uh, we are out of the woods. We still have significant threats especially with the third waves in Europe, uh, the rising cases in India, Brazil, among others. These are also poses a threat to our, our cases. So we need to work very hard to prevent them. And that is why the work at the airport remains very, very significant, especially uh, with, the, with the advent of new variants, which we may not know how uh, the Ghanaian population will handle that. So the positivity rate at the airport has significantly reduced, but um, there's a slight rise, and I think that's all because of that. One can say, uh, today is the 18th, that uh, any spike that happens after now, we cannot blame it on Easter, which means that the Easter system that we put in place has actually worked, because the two weeks have passed, and so uh, we need to, but we need to continue to protect ourselves, and that tells you how important that Adhering to the discipline in all these festivities is very, very important to avert any spread of the disease. We also have some good news for our schools, and it's good that the new ones are going in when the numbers are down. Because when you go to school at first, as you start having a spikes. So far, since we op reopened the schools, 345 schools have reported cases. We have recorded a total of 2,052 positives in all schools in the country. Our current active case number is 13, which means that all of them have recovered. 
99.4% have recovered. And I'm sure if I were to check today, our active number may have gone down. Both our region has recorded the highest number with 489 uh, cases. OT with nine has the lowest. Uh, uh, currently, OT has the highest number of active cases because their cases are quite recent compared to the other places. Northeastern region is the only region that had no case recorded. Bono, OT, and East are only region that have active cases among students, so the rest do not have any active cases. The full half slides of which we can share with you are the details of the number of schools per region and the number of active cases. So ladies and gentlemen, now we can get to our vaccination, which I'm sure we are all very keen to see what is happening. We have an update as at 18, that's our this morning total numbers. As at, um, say today, we have received a total of 966,850 vaccines. 600,000 from the COVAX facility, 50,000 from uh, as a donation from the Indian government. We have um, 165,000 from MTN Africa, and then 149,000 as a second also from MTN Africa, uh, bringing the total about 315,000 from the MTN uh, group. We have also have um, three, uh, about 16,000 Sputnik there, which we are yet to use uh, as we ho hope to get more and then we can put them to use. But I want to just, um, just take a lot of and expand a bit on what is our wastage. Vaccines usually have a wastage of between 5 to 10 percent. And the wastage can be broken bottles. It could be taken out of the vaccine container, you're unable to bring it back and that it stays more than the number of us who stay outside the cold chain, and um, a few other issues expiring. Recently, there's been the story that we've had thousands of vaccines expiring uh, in some regions. The truth of the matter is that the last 115,000 cases, uh, vaccines that were received, the second one was received on the 30th of March. The expiry date is on the 13th of April. So what it means that by the time we offloaded and distributed to the region, we started distribution on Good Friday. That is when vaccines were moving into the region to ensure that they are used before they expire. All regions were able to use it except for 480 doses that were not, could not be used in Northern region and 100 doses in OT. That is 48 bottles in Northern region and 10 bottles in that. If you look at the waste, that's quite low. And so uh, the numbers are not so bad. Looking at the time frame that we had, so that I think uh, we should uh, congratulate the API program, the public health, for, and the, all the people in the region for the sterling work they did to ensure that the vaccines were given to people. Some of them were going to churches, uh, going to chief's palaces to make sure that people who deserve the vaccines receive it. As of this morning, the total uploaded number of vaccines in our database is 783,560. But we have done more than about 850,000 already. As they continue to synchronize the data, the number will go up. But in brief, total number of health workers of the total vaccine received, 27% has gone to health workers. People with underlying condition have received about the same 27%. Uh, if you look at the proportion and all these things, and over 8, 23.1% have gone to people aged 60 and above. And of all this number, 63.8% of them are females. The next chart shows the daily increases in the number of people vaccinated. It's more of a collective curve that shows the number of people vaccinated. We have had two, two sessions of vaccination, I would say, all in the phase one, where as part of our segmentation. The first phase uh, has had about 522, 69% of them were given. The second phase was the one that was targeting more health workers and then other vulnerable people in the regions. All regions were given additional vaccine to continue with the first segmentation. That was, and that was what uh, was concluded 
I would say with the 13th, on the 12th, the midnight of the 13th, when those, the last vaccines were used for that. Now, I want to talk about the update on the vaccines, um, AstraZeneca vaccine, which is what we have received so far. Our goal is to vaccinate about 20 million persons by the end of the year. On the 1st of March, we launched the vaccination and we're giving us your way. The president, the vice president, a few people from the council of state were also giving vaccination. So we are doing the segmentation with over 50 teachers, over 50 health workers, people with underlying conditions, some essential uh, services, such as security persons, arms of government, and then mainly we started by the 43 hotspots districts in the country, which is where majority of our cases have come from. The idea was to just like kill the fire there so that we can spread, reduce the spread. But I think there's been a lot of information on AstraZeneca that I want to share with you. Unfortunately, this is too small, but I'm sure the slides will be made available to all of you. Based on some of the WHO recommendations on how to deploy uh, AstraZeneca. The recommendation is that um, it has to be the dosage of between 8 to 12 weeks interval doses. That is, you know, as far as vaccination is concerned, what we have most important is the minimum time within which a second shot, a booster dose can be given. If you do it before that minimum date, you will not get any benefit. But sometimes the longer you wait, it still doesn't matter that you can still have your second shot and get your booster dose uh, build up. The WHO has done a lot of studies and has also shown that number one is that if you give it before four weeks or before two weeks, there's virtually no benefit. But between two, 12, eight, and 12 weeks is the best time to give. Even then, you'd have lost some percentage of the antibodies is still effective enough to protect you. And so they have evidence for those who are done it just under 12 weeks, and they show that those who are done under six weeks did not show any benefit. What is the efficacy of one dose? According to the studies that have been done globally and around, it protects you about 76% protection for over 90, just about 90 days, which coincide with the, with the 12 um, weeks we are talking about. Subsequently, they have not done the next stage. A lot of work is being done now, and I'm sure when it's concluded, we'll see how long does the first dose really protect you before you are, become vulnerable. Even in that, about 80 to 94 percent of the people who have received their first dose within that period are protected from severe disease and death. And so what it means is that if more people have one dose, it's probably still save a lot, a lot more. But that's not to say uh, second dose is not important. And uh, a lot of evidence has shown that even when they have lost 34% of the initial antibodies that they built up, it's still very, very protective. And this is what informs our um, policy. Next slide. On how we're going to do a vaccination. So we chose eight weeks, not uh, at the earliest time one can receive the second dose. That's the earliest time, which means that if you took the second dose before eight weeks, it will not be beneficial. But that also gives us the four-week window that allow more people to get that for the second dose deployment and also for the ease of deployment. Because if you have more people on a particular day, you may not, doesn't mean that the father has some, you have 28 or so April on your card, means that you must by all means have it on that. Is that range is there. But even there's no further uh, data coming up to show that probably we, we could wait for much longer if it is possible. And so, given the vaccine availability, that is why we are now trying to shift it to the 12 weeks. But as vaccines are available, made available, like I said, the earliest in the eight weeks and that you'll be giving your vaccination. There are significant efforts being made and we have some assurance from COVAX that by May we'll get vaccination and if we get our vaccine in May, we'll be able to do our second doses and do, and as a service, you are more concerned with having more people with the first dose. 
because that's what can also cause the distance. But we've got enough, and there are also bilateral arrangements that are bringing in other COVAX vaccines, including um, Johnson & Johnson, which we are expecting probably in the third or fourth quarter of the year. And then a lot of work is going on to get vaccine uh, Sputnik for everybody. So we are showing people that the fact that if you don't get it on the, on the eighth week, doesn't mean there's something wrong. We still have a four-week window and beyond to have it, and we are expecting more vaccines to come in to provide the, the protection that we all need. Uh, so most of who were vaccinated are expected to be vaccinated on the, at the earliest April, but that gives us the, the scope to move beyond those, those times. So we still enough time to wait. So, Honorable Minister, our next uh, step, we are pursuing additional vaccines, as I mentioned, more bilateral and COVAX facility as far as the AstraZeneca is concerned, Johnson & Johnson, and then the Sputnik to vaccinate as many Ghanaians as possible. Um, but in the meantime, let's continue with our safety protocols. Because like we said, even the highest vaccine with the highest coverage of 94% does not cover everybody. You still have 6% of the population who can have the disease, but of course they are protected from severe illness. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Colleagues, we're going to um, ask that the microphone be made available. Uh, in respect of COVID protocols, you just give me a wave where you are. I'll ask the microphone to be brought to you, and then you can uh, ask your question. Um, just to recap, we have had three briefs this afternoon. The first uh, spells out how stakeholders have agreed to clamp down on unethical broadcast content with immediate effect. The second is on how the Ghana Investment Promotion Center is ensuring that there are about $2.7 billion worth of investments that accrued to Ghana in 2020 yield full returns uh, for the people of Ghana. And the third, on the matter of vaccines, if I'm hearing Ghana Health Service correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying don't panic. Uh, the second dose is pegged between eight and 12 weeks, uh, but you are even better off with it. Even beyond. Or even beyond. Because I have a question here that after 12 weeks, is it therefore of no, no use? But I'll come to that one. <laughs> so uh, uh, the point I'm making is that don't panic. The second dose, the earliest is the eight weeks, but you still have time. And you are better off even with one, uh, one level of protection as we try to get to other levels. So it's time to take your questions. Just give me a wave. I'll ask the microphone to be brought to you, and then we can take your questions. And we'll take them in either languages. So we'll move forward. Are there any questions? Abednego. OK. Good afternoon, Abu. Yeah. Um, from Abednego Asante, my question is, um, my question is, Dr. Bwaje, what is the vaccination of my ultimate concern that contributes to the success in decline cases? And what is the decline of cases in decline? What is the protocol of the amount of food in my cases in decline? And also, vaccines, you know, if you go to the first day, they receive an every good school system anymore. A man from person or no better my wall. And I said, you know, as an 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 let me be sorry, sir. Timing and content in a vaccine in the BS fire, and I say I didn't contribute to that. I'll take some more questions. If not, then I'll end on um, Abednego's questions. Um, so, two things. Doc, on that last question, mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to nuance it a little bit. Are we saying that the timelines for receipts? were the ones that were shorter comparatively as compared to the other batches we received, or we are seeing that though that timeline was regular, there was a delay in making it available to a particular place 
for which reason it expired. I think you have to nuance it and be clear uh, on that. Then I have a first question I'm adding to it. So what does it mean? Does it mean that if I get my shot maybe after 12 weeks, it is ineffective? If you can add that to it for me. Do you have any? Okay, yes, there's a question there. Let me take that one. Yes, sir. Yeah. Honorable, my name is Aaron Nah, Joy News. Um, I want to ask a question based on the GIPC brief. Okay. Okay, so concerning the investment, um, you do mention that, you do mention some countries. I didn't hear Germany, because I remember VW from Germany also came in as a last year. And I want to know whether the manufacturing bit, it includes automobile, because I didn't hear that one too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They are bringing the microphone to you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Baji, um, good afternoon. A pandemic of this nature, is it possible that uh, it's going to end um, in the future or we are going to battle it for a very long haul? Uh, because uh, it's like it's lingering on. Uh, is there going to be any place, uh, is there going to be a possibility of ending it uh, along the line? And again, the vaccines, uh, does it heal other diseases apart from the COVID itself? Thank you. I don't think I heard your first question. Did you hear the first question? Well, okay, all right. So, colleagues, are these the only questions? Doc, we're in your hands. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I bet Nego. Um, our question was say protocols nineteen are about from an answer. Yes, protocols no a be brem say start to about vaccination and no numbers no as I say about now. The Senna protocols no. Uh, this we move to our 52%. Ah, almost a mass near the other. I boy, but in Oba, I believe three to four weeks and son of when you are antibodies protection. You see, I can say, dear, anti vaccine is so no, I don't know, dear, I become one as a tea effect. But the initial phase is not there, nine years, you know, they take a bar and son of what will they not protection to protect the 17 years. So it's both the protocols. And now we can say that the vaccine in where they have received is also playing a major role in preventing the spread of the virus. Um, are vaccine cells still available? Yes, we still are doing our segmentation for the most vulnerable ones. It's not a lot, but we still have some vaccines for, for the most vulnerable, which is still being uh, deployed as far as the distance are concerned, but it's not enough. Uh, we are looking to get in more vaccines to address that. So why did we have the wastage? I think Ghana probably has one of the best deployment systems for vaccination as possible. If I tell you the other country received COVAX with us, how many they've been able to deploy, you will not believe it. But we have a very efficient system of deployment. Deploying Vaccine. This is not polio where you drop in the mouth. This is a vaccine that requires a lot of important database. They are moving from place to place, and people are coming to places to have the vaccination done. And to have done that number in 10 days, um, maybe apart from the Ghanaian in India, other people who understand vaccination are very, very impressed how we're able to do it without even fewer uh, losses that we've done. And this is all over the country. It's not just in one place. For that one, we expanded to all the countries, all the regions in the country. So it is not because uh, we did not plan. In fact, on, Chris, on Easter Day, vaccination was going on. The vaccines moved on Good Friday. The following Saturday, people were given because we knew that we needed to. We, we don't have vaccines and we have this good opportunity. We didn't want to waste it. So a lot was done. And all the regions, except for those places, had issues. And you can see that these are regions with access problems. And so I'm not surprised that OT and Northern Region had the problem they had. Um, so what does it mean if you have a vaccine after 12 weeks? Like I said, vaccination has a minimum time within which you can take a booster. Before that time doesn't work, but any time after, it helps you. But as you wait for long, because you may drop, some uh, protection may drop, you are probably not as protected as, uh, let's say we are talking about a 12, 13 or so weeks. 
But anytime you get your second dose, your booster goes on. And like we said, there are studies going on about how long it's happening. Others are reporting as long as six months. When we're waiting for the data to be completed. We want to be sure that we are certain about that. Some are reporting 24 weeks as the protection part within which you can wait to get a second dose. But that's not our policy. Our policy is working within that range that we have currently uh, have to, to look at. So um, um, the vaccine, the, your question is, the first one, yes, um, it is possible that the virus may not disappear, but we can control it with vaccination and ensure that it doesn't kill. The Spanish flu came in 1918. I think it's still with us. But we are able to manage, and I think that's what is likely uh, to happen. But the vaccine is only for protecting against COVID-19. Uh, COVID but I'm sure as studies go on, if we realize there's some other benefits it has a collateral, I mean, the further benefits, protection from other viruses, we will know. And you know there are many medicines that were made for other things, but they found to be doing something better in other places. Yes, um, he was asking about the question of the side effects. These are minor side effects which we had broadcasted, and the manufacturer had also mentioned during the trial that you can have temperature, you can have headache, you can have many adverse events, and that's why we deliberately measure adverse events. Anything happens, that happens to you after vaccination, we are interested to see, then we look at it, whether it's related to the vaccine or something else. And so, headaches, when I took mine, I, I had fever, but I was expecting that. You see, when you take vaccine, your body is responding to it and producing antibodies and etc. And so the body will react. And so some of them will have effects that may be mild, they may not even notice. Some can have very, very difficult situation for a few days. And so uh, we anticipate. And that's why when we we're doing health workers, we didn't go to one hospital and vaccinate a lot of them. We scheduled them. We want to make sure that the following day, enough health workers come to work. But we expect that some will have fever, some will have headaches. So you don't want to go to rage and vaccinate all health workers in that day and then expect that the following day. And I'm sure if you do that, the following day you have about 40% of people not coming to work. So that's how it is. So it's to be expected. And this we're given to people through from here. And as we've mentioned all that, that you expect some of these side effects. My name is Ebenezer Kwe from Metro TV. Now, the BBC reports that um, the US, South Africa, and the European Union is taking down, um, or they are stopping the rollout of Johnson & Johnson vaccine job. You mentioned that we'll be receiving uh, Johnson & Johnson. Do you think as a country we, uh, we need it in the face of this report? Yeah. Yes, I think um, they mentioned as a rare side effect. Uh, I don't know whether I'm saying next you try and buy parastamol, a box of parastamol, and take out the leaflet and read the side effects that they will list there. Everything has side effects, but it's about what is the cost benefit analysis? What is the benefit of taking the vaccine against not taking the vaccine? And I think that's why for all vaccines, that's the decision. That is me. That's why in Europe, not the whole Europe, there are so many, country, many countries in Europe who are continuing to deploy the Johnson and Johnson. And so they just ask for a short break to study, to see how they are. We've gone through that, the same similar experience with AstraZeneca. After one week, they say it's good enough, everybody go back and use it. So I think it is, uh, it's an abundance of caution that these things are done just to show what is it happening, what is it causing, this is something we can do about it. So I think it's fairly, perfectly normal to have such caution. But you have to balance it whether the cost of not having the vaccine against that, which one really uh, affects you. I think there are just about 30 or so 
six cases of uh, severe uh, um, clotting that we have identified. I think also it's worth mentioning that um, one of the things that various countries have tried to do in this COVID response agenda is to be as transparent as possible. So sometimes you will come across one or two stories out of seven million uh, vaccines that have been administered. You are coming across it because there's the desire to be overly transparent. Uh, but it does not necessarily mean that that is the trend or the majority position and therefore that should cause any point of panic. But specifically, I think there's also a question. I'm seeing some questions as our teams are streaming online. The Sputnik V, what is the story? Have they started administering it in Ghana? Uh, no, we, I mean, what we have is not enough to start, but we are expecting some within the short, I mean, within a week or two, we should have having some Sputnik Vs come in. The other one is um, the duration between the first and second is three weeks. They always come in pairs, and the people who get their first dose get the second dose immediately, three weeks. Okay, colleagues, I think um, we're at a good point to uh, draw down the curtain on the first brief for this week. We may re-engage you uh, by Wednesday, depending on the uh, activities that come up during the week. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bajik, and our you. colleagues from GIPC. Uh, thank you.